I am live. Are we recording? Yes, I think so. We are recording. Okay, perfect. Hi, Joshua. Hi, Christy. Hi, Stephen and Sam. Hey guys, we're gonna start in like two minutes. I think you guys are on mute, but there's a little chat box um, that you can write notes in. Where is our little chat box? Let me see, chat box. Okay, I have my chat box. So if you guys, I know you're on mute, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to type out questions on the side. Um, if you click on your chat box on your Zoom, or if you're on your phone, you can also um, text a question to everyone or just to individual people here. Perfect, yes, feel free to ask us any questions and um, I will I'll look at the chat box periodically. Okay, so we are going to start right now. Um, real quick, my name is April Campasuk, and I uh, I work out of the Lepe Tenwell office. I'm a real estate agent um, and a real estate home investor. So I do flip homes in San Diego. Um, and I mean, I kind of this is all my information. So if you guys have any questions or want to follow me or look at before and afters, I show I showcase properties that we're actively renovating right now. And then I do our flipping Friday where I showcase different properties that we're flipping and send or in every Friday. Hi. Okay. So uh, uh, real quick, the reason this workshop is for any type of, anyone who's interested in the buying process, the flipping process, anything, anyone who's interested in real estate in general, um, if you own real estate property and you wanna take advantage of your equity, the biggest question I get from just friends and family or clients for clients ask me is what, what should I do if I need to update my house? So I'm going to kind of go over kind of what I recommend that will bring value. Um, what else items that I recommend if you're going to list your property. And if you're a buyer who actually is just looking to buy houses right now and maybe want to make a house your own, don't be scared to buy a fixer. I think fixers are the best thing because you can actually transform anything into uh, you know, your dream property. You just need to know how to do it and what will bring you value. Like, So I'm going to go over all that today. If you have any questions, don't be shy. Just write it on the side. Hey, that kind of rhymed. <laughs> okay, so let's get to it. Uh, so my background, um, I am a real estate agent and I flip homes. So I flip about seven to 10 real estate properties in, throughout San Diego. This is kind of a little background so then you know exactly um, my experience. And I wholesale with investors. I work with listing, or listing properties and I work also with buyers and sellers. And the reason why I got into real estate is I really believe in passive income. And that's really buying and holding real estate. So whatever money I make from the flips, I invest it into buy and hold rentals. Um, and then this is KRI Homes is the entity that I buy and flip homes from. I've been recognized as a top sales uh, official of silver for last year for the recognition of excellence. Okay, so let's talk about the do's, the start out. So I'm going to talk about just quick, really easy tips. So for some of you who are possibly looking at a house that, or actually looking, you have a house that maybe you've inherited or that you've lived there for a really long time. So you're going to put it on the market possibly next year and you want to set aside some money. So what should, should what items should you upgrade? So these are some do's that I highly highly recommend the one of the easiest do is actually painting you don't have to be a professional painter i would recommend um if you had to just paint a couple things i would just make sure you paint the front door because that is actually the first impression that you have and so if someone comes to see your house they're going to go to your front door i've seen the front doors kind of tells you the story of the house so if someone's door front door is faded <laughs> then maybe that inside of the house isn't the greatest. So I try to up tell you, just recommend to paint a couple items. If you want to paint, 
certain things, I would recommend painting so your house has a neutral color. So if you have like blue walls, red walls, things like that, those are the walls I would tackle down with like a soft gray or like light color, even white would help. Removing popcorn ceiling. I actually have seen a lot of houses that have popcorn ceiling and we purchase those all the time. But once you remove that popcorn ceiling, it does make your house look a lot better. Not, I mean, it feels better. The texture looks better. It doesn't make your house look so old. So if you can, if you have those popcorn ceilings, you need to remove those. And then simple landscaping. So I would say, when I say simple landscaping, not um, pretty much cleaning out your overgrown trees, anything that's maybe, maybe go like DG or or I would, I usually put a lot of bark in a lot of our flips because it's low maintenance. So those are kind of the keys of simple, simple ideas for landscaping. I think updating your kitchen is one of my favorites, but it is very expensive. So if you have the budget to update your kitchen, that's something I would do. And whether you're buying, you're flipping a home, maybe it's your first flip, that's actually something that would sell your house for top dollar. And it doesn't mean you're updating by changing and getting brand new cabinets. You could paint your cabinets we just did for one of the rentals and change the countertops. So that really helps. Um, and then updating your bathroom could be not just a tile, but you can change the vanity, the toilet, even the fixture, the mirror that brings up some, makes your house look brand new once you change a couple items. And the carpet is actually the easiest thing and most inexpensive. So if you have carpets, if it has stains on it, they can't, you can't remove it, then that's probably one of the most inexpensive flooring to do. So if you have like tile, it's kind of expensive to replace or laminate or wood laminate, anything like that. I, if you can replace it or repair it, that would be great, but I would replace the carpet. And I think the easiest when you're getting ready to put on your property to on the market is actually just decluttering or getting it organized or hire a professional cleaner because that actually just makes and brings increases the value or the feel of your home. Um, upgrading appliances is something that I would recommend. So try to get, if you have stainless steel, make it all stainless steel around. Um, Cause I've seen houses or I see houses that have mismatched appliance color and it does look like it's not put together. And then I would change the front door handle and locks too, just to make it, cause that is the first impression. So those are some do's if you're looking to increase your home value or these are things that you can do if you buy a fixer. Those are very quick, easy, cost effective, cost effective um, do's to do. Let's get into the don'ts. Okay, so these are the fun parts because a lot of, these are things that a lot of people will do or consider to do and I'm just telling you from personal experience don't do it <laughs> so leave most of the things to professional if you're if, such as plumbing electrical and tile work so can you see in this example right here from far away it doesn't look bad but actually if you look very closely the tiles actually are not evenly done you, this is not done by a professional you see how the lines are, are not straight at all this is if someone watched, um, I mean, maybe uh, YouTube how to put on tile and then put the tile on here. This isn't done professionally and you can tell. And someone who's looking at buying your house or if you were to, you know, this is your house, you would like those lines not straight right there. And then when you're ready to actually renovate, you don't wanna to forget to mentally prepare yourself for timeline and changing uh, changes and time order. So that means that if a contractor tells you that it's gonna take two weeks, it might take three weeks. So you wanna mentally prepare yourself that things timelines do change. And then you don't wanna always hire the most cheapest and expensive work. You wanna, you get what you pay for. So I would normally do is whenever I'm looking for a tile person, a maybe a carpet person, someone who's doing my electricity, I will actually get three bids. And even at today, I still do that. Even, even when I've been renovating a lot of homes, I still get a couple of bids. And I, I don't always go with the most inexpensive one. I usually go with the one that I do my investigation with. So I check their work. 
I see samples of their work and then I see if they can match the most inexpensive person and then I go with them. So that's usually my tip for um, what to do when you're hiring contractors. And for installing front doors, these are really tough because with front doors, they can be very pricey and it kind of, it's the same thing with the paint. You want to just make it look clean. So if you don't go out there and buy an expensive front door, you want to get a door that just looks clean and modern because something that you might like might not be the best. Like I've seen people put in like these very nice front doors, but they're they're maybe more custom towards the person who likes it and not everyone, it's not easy on everyone. Like it could be a bunch of uh, windows when someone wants a plain door. Um, and then don't remodel your home office. I, what I mean by remodel, like you can have a clean home office, but no, don't add big built-in shelves or desks that makes the room appear smaller. Um, install a in-ground pool. So if you're planning to sell your house, Building or installing a, uh, a pool does not always bring value to your home because not everyone wants a swimming pool when they're buying a house. And there's a couple other things that you don't want to do if you're buying or selling or flipping is you don't want to add a sunroom or anything unpermitted. So those are some tips. And then any backup generators and anything, any expensive window treatment. So like like very expensive I would say any type of window treatment. Most most of the time, the houses that we sell or a lot of the homes are remodeled, they don't actually have any window treatment. They like to have no window treatment, no blinds, anything. It just looks uh, very bright in the room. And that's the reason why most of the time I don't recommend any type of window treatment. There's a couple questions. Does anyone have any questions? I know I'm going through this really quick. Anyone have any questions on what they were thinking about doing? Well, I have a private question. Um, so someone asked, um, how much would you spend if you were renovating your bathroom or kitchen? So this is more of, for, for personally, if you're, if you get away with doing low, like, maybe like painting the cabinets and changing the countertop, that could be a couple of thousand. Um, if you're looking at a full kitchen, I would say, or a bathroom, I would say most of the time we spend at least 6,000 on a bathroom and we spend close to 10,000 on a kitchen. So those are some prices right there. Sorry, I just threw your question out there. Anyone else have a question on there? Okay, so we're going to get through a little bit about contractors. So this is actually really important. I wish I would have known some of this information from the beginning. Um, I Working with contractors and subcontractors are very different. And so um, a question I have, so a couple questions between subcontractor and contract. Does anyone actually know the difference? Because I'm going to go over that. And so I can go a little bit more thoroughly in it, but um, let me ask her the first, I have a question on the side. Someone wants to know, is 6,000 on each bathroom or all together? So it depends. If I'm doing, uh, it's on each bathroom. So if it's a master bathroom, I'm spending close to 6,000. If it's going to be like a half bathroom, then I could probably get less than that. Or if it's a, if I'm just doing uh, like just doing the vanity, the toilet, and not doing anything to the tile work or the shower, then it's really, it's a couple hundred dollars. Great question. Okay, so for contracting, so when you, what do you need to know about construction? So you've got to get behind the doors or just a little bit idea of what, how contractors work. So if anyone's a contractor on there, on here, these are just little bullet points. So it's just something that I've learned from experience. So for timelines, they're not actually deadlines. They're just kind of like a idea to get kind of an uh, more like an ideal time that they're thinking about finishing, but they're not actually the real deadline. Um, prices do change per job based on availability. So I've actually noticed this through time. Like I've had 
the same contractor bid me on like maybe a plumbing job or a tile work and it actually changes based on if they're really busy so if they're not very busy then their price is pretty low but the more busier they are the more expensive they charge you um, so negotiation is possible so you want to do the multiple bids don't be afraid to ask them for a better better price. I think that's the biggest part about working with contractors is you can ask them for a better deal. And I would definitely ask them. And don't pay anyone up front or if you have to, or without a contract. So if you have to pay for anything, you should only pay 10% or just the material for it. So let's say you're you're installing a toilet you can go ahead and buy that toilet or an item, but you don't wanna pay someone up front for the entire job. Um, and then some of them show up, at, uh, some don't show up on time and they're, they're basically show up late. So they say, hey, I'm gonna be here at seven. They might not show up till like eight o'clock and that's kind of like the contractor time. So, but they do start typically really early. So contractors start around seven or eight, sometimes six o'clock. Um, and they usually try to leave before the end of the business day, just during during super early, especially if they're working outside, it gets really warm. So that's why they start very early. And then um, for pricing for materials, you want to buy most of the material if you can yourself or check on the receipts, because a lot of times they will mark up the price of an item and you'll you'll end up paying them for labor and their material plus the material plus a little bit more um, remodeling is really messy so you want to have a game plan i don't recommend living through uh construction however i do see a lot of people do that if you have remodeling happening at your house i suggest have a game plan on if where you're going to stay or if you're going to be um you know if you you can block a half your house or so or so because it gets very messy. And then what where I call it avoid change or change order, which is called upselling or cross selling. It kind of reminds me of whenever I go like get my nails or something. I come in wanting this and they upsell for all these extra things. The same thing with contracting. Like you want to buy some, you're asking to change or do something for you at home, and then they're changing everything, asking you if you want the upgrades. And so if you can't avoid them, then I would try to avoid them if you want to stick to a budget. Okay, so there is a difference between subcontractors and contractors. So if you are working with a direct contractor, they are hired by a, a customer like myself or like yourself. Their main goal is to build that relationship uh, by keeping the project organized and on schedule. So they're the ones that pretty much will have direct contact with you. They're, the benefit is they do want, um, they, they want to pri pri prioritize the customer's needs and wants throughout the project, but they're not always the one that actually does the work. So that's different. So you usually hire the contractor and they, it, depending on what they're capable of doing, but they might be subbing some of the work to another contractor. Like I would usually hire a contractor to be in charge and then he would hire the plumber and he hired the electrician. And there are two different people. So the subcontractors are hired by the contractors and they're, they have certified tech. So they are certified to do one item. Like they are just do the air conditioning. They only do the plumbing. They only touch and do paint. And that's actually hired by the contractors. So the difference is if you hire a contractor, they're the project manager and they will manage all the subs that you have. But it's very expensive because contractors will do some work, but they will they will sub the contract the rest and take a take a cut of it because they are managing the subcontractors. So that's why a lot of times you'll see um, prices change and depending on if you hired a subcontractor yourself or if you hired a contractor who found the worker. So that's kind of the trick. So that's why I always say fine, get a couple bids before you decide who to go with. And that's the difference between working with a contractor and a subcontract. Um, and then I have a question in the box. Okay, the question is, would you hire, is your contract, can your contractor do plumbing? 
So that, or electricity. So yes, so the contractor is, when you're a contractor, your specialty is in certain, that your specialty can be a, a framing, plumbing, electricity. You have to have a couple of trades of your specialty and then you hire the rest on. So a lot of times, some contractors are actually um, certified techs for those trades. Great question. Do we have any other questions here? What type of contract do you use for the contractor? Can you repeat that? What's the name of the contract that you use for the contractor? What's the name of the contractor? The contract. Oh, the contract. It's just basically, so the uh, everyone has their own, it's just a bid. So there's a bid and an invoice. So um, there's not like a special name. Most of them have, it's just one page. Actually it's one to two pages. So if it's with the contractor, they have their own and it basically breaks down the bid. So it's basically everything um, that they're doing for the project. And then on there, they'll also specify whether they're collecting a deposit and the deposit cannot be more than 10% if, and then it shows their license number and then any, and then all that information right there. So you can look them up by there. And then you would sign the, the back of the contract or the end of the contract. Right, so there's not, you. it's just a bid. And so there's a bid and an invoice. So the bid is just the contract. And then the invoice is, so periodically, so they'll break it down. So if you're paying 10%, then you will, they'll, they'll actually break it down on the bid on how you're supposed to pay them. So if you're supposed to pay them 10,000 for their whole job, then they'll have you pay the 1,000 up front or like whatever amount that you guys agree to. And then they'll have you pay, um, they'll have you break it down by like three payments. Like you'll pay halfway um, when they're almost done and then when they're completely done. And I would never pay a contractor the full amount until they're until you um, inspect the work. So, and then they should finish it and then you should pay them the last pay. Good question. Okay, does it, oh, I have a question right here. How do you know if they're licensed? That's actually a really good question because every contractor pretty much will say they're somewhat licensed. You actually can go on, um, you actually can on their, you can ask, actually ask for their information, but they should have on their business card, their license number. And online, you can actually look on, I think it's like the California State Board Licensing and you type in that license number, it'll populate if they have a license, um, if they have any um, judgments or liens or anything against their license, and then you can also see all their information there too. And that's actually the same website. You could report someone who's unlicensed that's working on your project. Okay, I have that question. I have a question right here on... Okay, actually, I'm going to pull up this part. I'm going to go back on the do nots. So the question was uh, for the do not send room and unpermitted that the, if you have one, what do you mean by do not? So do not means do not add a send room or add an unpermitted square footage. If you already have that in your space, then you all you can do is make it look better. So you can't, I wouldn't recommend. Now difference is, okay, so let's clarify that. So in San Diego, there is a lot of um, older neighborhoods and have additional spaces or turn, turn their garage into a livable space. So what that means is that it may or may not be permitted. So how I decide what to do is if it's a house that is on the tax roll or let's say it shows that there's a garage and if there's when you get to the house and there is no garage if there's plenty of parking I try to keep that as no garage but if there's no parking at all then I will try to convert that back into a garage um, and then if there's add-ons or unpermitted space but it's not it's done well like it's done to code just not permitted and you can tell the difference is because a home that's unpermitted is usually 
or isn't done well is actually doesn't meet the standard heights. And you can tell by the flooring and the, the roof line. So uh, the minimum height needs to be at least 73, which is a little bit over seven feet. But normally, most heights should be about eight feet. So something that's not permitted usually is shorter. And then the, the room sizes, it's, it's pretty narrow too. Like if you see hallways, a lot of hallways are too skinny or unpermitted as well. So if you have something like that um, and, and you live in that array, that's okay. You just make it look as best as it can, um, but just don't add it. So that was the answer. Just don't add it. Okay. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. You don't have to click it to everyone. You can actually just go for individual or like private. Okay, so a little bit back on here, I kind of went over everything here. So the next part I really, I wanna just kind of go over is um, a passive income. So I know that's kind of a little bit different in the segue. Um, in the beginning part, I mentioned a little bit about what to do when you're looking to remodel your home. And I'm actually gonna go back to my slide. So I had a slide right here. When I started getting into real estate, uh, my goal was actually to buy rentals and then have passive income um, for the future. And then over time, I found a passion with buying and flipping homes. And that's kind of how I got into getting my real estate license. Um, but the passive income is something that's very important. So for anyone who's on this call, that's kind of the message that we try to uh, tell our clients is like, hey, when you buy your very first home, whether it's a fixer or not, um, the goal is actually to invest into your a home and then renovate it or live in it and then and try to keep it or flip it so you can make top dollar. So the goal is always to invest into your future. And so that's the goal of like, why I think it's very important that if you're on this call, you're looking to either increase your equity in the current home or buying a house that's a fixer. And so I, I, very, I do encourage you to continue to look for that and don't be afraid to buy a house if, it, if it's not the best house, because there are a couple of things like this, like doing minor things that will help increase your home value. And then also things that you shouldn't do. Um, I think recently I had a really good phone call with a friend of mine who um, actually she bought a brand new house in a new community. And then she was calling me about what to do to renovate it. And I thought it was a very strange call because it's a new community. And I guess it's because when you buy a new community, this is something, a tip that I wanted to share to you guys is that when you buy a new community, they actually give you a house that is, you have the choice to do upgrades. And when you do, if you don't choose to do the upgrades, then you get the base model of the house. So she started calling because she said she wanted to change everything of her brand new house in a new community. And so I kind of just went over this too, like, okay, let's talk about, I mean, you have a brand new kitchen, but she doesn't have, she didn't have backsplash. She didn't have um, upgraded uh, countertops. So we just kind of changed everything. And then now her house is to exactly what she wants. Um, and then now, and that's by simply just going for things that will help improve your home. And it, so even if your house right now isn't, I guess the point is if your house, if you're looking to buy a house, don't be afraid to buy a fixer. And if you're looking to uh, renovate your home to sell, these are some of the best tips that I would recommend. Okay, so I have, oh, I have one more last question. The question is, what is, how do you, I guess, what is the minimum amount of money you should spend if you renovate your home? This is a tough question. So when I flip a house, I spend a minimum of, I think the most inexpensive I've spent is probably around 21,000. Now that's just because I'm renovating the house itself. If I was to just fix like a rental, I'd probably spend about 10,000. And that's to do like the majority of the house.
Okay, I have this question came in. I don't know, you guys aren't typing it in, you're just sending it to me. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask the question. You can put speaker, or you can go on loud. So the question was, um, how long should it take you to flip a house? So if you're flipping a house to, if you're flipping a house and putting on the market to three sell, I would say about, uh, I would say about eight to 10 weeks. So almost three months. If you are doing it for yourself, like let's say you bought the house, I would plan on about 30 to 45 days of renovation before you can get into that house. So if you're in escrow right now, about to close, plan about 30 days until you move in, if you're going to fix it up. And how to get the best prices? I would say the best prices, it's really tough because this is a hard question because there's a lot of houses, there's not a lot of inventory right now. So I think you have to be open to looking everywhere. So not only on the market, off the market, I love Craigslist. I talk, tell everyone about that all the time, but also friends and family. So if you know anyone who's looking to me possibly uh, change their home, um, that's you can pretty much try to work a deal with them and you can call an agent and just, I've had people do that where they'll call someone in the office or myself and say, hey, I, my friend is selling and I wanna buy, can you help us with the transaction? And we can do that with you too. The question is, what is the average amount of money you can, whoa, whoa, what on, it's moving so fast. Okay, what is the average um, amount of money you can ups, uh, upsell by spending, okay, a certain amount? I would say, what's the average? So. This is a good question. It depends. It depends on where you're. So I guess I can answer this in two ways. I would say that if uh, you'll get whatever you put into your kitchen, you generally get the value plus more. So if you put in like ten thousand, you it, it will make bring up like twenty thousand more. So I would just double. I would double it. So that's kind of one of the things that I would. I can answer it by like, what's the average amount of money? I, I would say that if you put in, for your bathroom, if you put in like, maybe like clean it up, put in a couple of thousand, it would make your bathroom look a lot better. So let's say for price wise, if you were gonna sell a house, I think the last house we did like a quick cleanup, um, we put in, I think this was for a client actually, Volter had a really good story too about it. So there's a picture of a client who had a really, really, really packed house. He was, they were cluttering. I think they put about 8,000 in total in the house. And so originally they were gonna sell it for about 400,000 and that 8,000, they were able to actually sell that house for 450 just because they put in 8,000. So that's kind of like a good number that I think about all the time, that if you were, if the house is priced at this price, not renovated, if you put in like maybe 10 to 15,000, what price would it be at that cost? And that's how I do my numbers. What is the best way to interview a contractor? So that's one question. So uh, I think the best way to interview them is basically you want to, you want to have, what I'll do is if they have a project for anyone to do, I generally will go out to that project and set interviews or set appointments for contractors back to back, like maybe like in maybe 30 minutes to an hour apart so they don't run into each other and just meet them at the job site to show them exactly what you want to do. Um, I actually will, before I set an appointment with them, I've either got a referral or information about them, spoke to them over the phone. Um, and, and or and ask them for like a project that they have but the best way to do is actually at the job site so they can they can see exactly what you're looking for um, and do I have recommendations so it depends on what you're looking for so um, you can always send me a message but I recommend for contractors I try to recommend because we try a lot of different people so I don't use the same person that does my my landscaping, I just keep them outside. And I have someone who does concrete, I have a, a different roofer. So I kind of subcontract a lot of the work because a lot of contractors can do everything, but I pick and choose who I think can do the best of it. So I have a really good guy who paints like very great outside, great inside, 
but I would never let him do anything in like anything else but paint. <laughs> so I kind of just stick to my, who I know that can do that job pretty well. So the question to clarify was if you spent X amount of money, would you get, uh, would you get, why amount of money for it? So yeah, so if the dues, if you spend X, whatever you spend on your dues, like these items I picked out there, you'll get at, you'll get your money back and more. If you start doing things that are on your X amount of money, um, it won't bring you value. Every single one will have like a different value. That's why they, there's also a list of items that will bring your top dollar to your home. And I think one of the items that everyone says is just, you know, the kitchen and bath which I recommend, but those are pricier items to do. The, the best items to do is to keep your house clean and do the paint and changing out the flooring because that actually brings the best value. Because when you walk into someone's house, if their floors aren't the greatest, it doesn't, it, it doesn't bring the value because you're walking and you feel it and you see it. So changing the flooring is one of my favorite tips. And you do not have to be licensed to flip homes. You sh uh, or, or, a real estate license and you do you do and you don't have to be licensed to do contracting work so for an example is and this is personally for myself my roofer is licensed and I, my painter is not so I you don't have to be you don't have to have a certain I mean you should try to hire people that are all licensed but if I'm just doing a small job on something, I'll just have him do it because I know his job, his work is really good. But there's a difference between a licensed contractor and a certified tech. Like a lot of um, a lot of plumbers are certified plumbers where they go to trade school or electrician is certified, but they don't have they don't have their own company and they don't have like pay for their insurance and stuff. So those are certified techs. So what they do is they work for a licensed company. But uh, so they work for like a contractor or a company that will license them. And then for small fixed up stripe, uh, do yourself paints and stuff like things like that. Yes, I don't, I don't usually get someone who's fully licensed. I think my licensed people you generally are electrician, the plumber, um, the roofer, the roofer is really hard because people, you they're up there so you want to make sure that if anything happens or doesn't hurt um my hvac person um is licensed so i usually use license for those like if there's someone's going to come in and paint my cabinets they're not going to be they don't have to be licensed um putting your countertops on they don't have to be licensed tile as well I don't, my tile person is licensed, but I've had unlicensed tile people as well who have been, um, who worked for a company that was licensed. Do we have any more questions? I have a private question coming through. Hold on, let me read this one. Oh, I think I kind of answered this one. The question is, is it a good time to sell right now because it is the end of the year and we're in the middle of the election or going to have elections? So I think it's always a good time to uh, buy or sell just because I'm personally an investor. Uh, but right now, I, in particular, there's not a lot of inventory. So if you were looking to sell at it right now, I would recommend maybe taking a look at what the value of your home would be if you were to sell. You may not have to renovate it, it completely and it will sell for top dollar because there isn't a lot of inventory and there's also uh, interest rates are super low. So you're seeing a lot of buyers who may not have qualified to buy homes last year are qualified now because of where the interest rates are. And so if you are looking to, uh, to sell or considering it, it is a very good time to sell. It's also a really good time to buy because your interest rates are really low. Just, there's not a lot of inventory. <laughs> Great. So it is, um, we, if you guys have any other questions, oh, I think it just came in. Uh, 
Okay, so this is a great question. If you're looking to buy a home and flip it, how do you know if there if it has equity? So you have to run your value on the homes and that's com called comparables. And you don't have to be a real estate licensed person to know what the house is worth. Uh, before I even gave you my license, I was already investing to real estate and I would do all my comps through Zillow. And now there's Redfin, there's HomeSnap. Um, I usually will do the same thing as you would want to figure out what the house is worth using those websites or how or you can, if you have an agent you're working with, or you can also get them to run the numbers. And then how you would know if there's equity in it is basically how much the house is worth. And then you want to figure out how much you need to rehab it or how much money it would take to, to renovate. So the rule of thumb is I would basically I always just do a quick math and say, let's say there's a house, um, I base it on the square footage. I would do between $25 to $45 a square feet. And that's how I'd come with easy math on how much renovation I would put into a house, even without going out to see it based on location. So if the location is in a high end area, I'm looking at like $40 to $45 a square feet. If I'm looking at a house that's maybe just like in um that's like just the normal like first time home buyer price point or resale price point in the four or five hundred thousand then i'll probably lean towards 25 dollars to 30 dollars a square feet and then that way and then how you know it has equity is basically you want to do the math is figure out what it's worth you're going to subtract how much you're going to uh, remodel it and then an easy way to do it is just figure out um, where, you know, what price it's selling for, or if you're looking to, um, or like, let's say you are under contract, you'll figure out how much money you can rehab. So that's, a, you can do it backwards. So let's say it's worth 500,000 after you did your, re your math, you have a contract of 400,000, then there's a spread of 100,000, right? So if you were to renovate this house, I would not renovate more than 100,000 because that's all you have that's worth in it, because then you'll be upside down. But if you're going to flip it, you have to actually con consider other costs that comes in play. For an example, is resale costs, um, also carrying costs, and then and then also your taxes. So if you were going to buy a house, you want to talk to someone prior agent or someone who can run the numbers for you to make sure you're profitable. So that's a good question. Okay, so if you have any, um, if you have any other questions, you can always, uh, uh, <laughs> of course, thank you, welcome. If you can always send me a, a quick, actually all my information is here. Um, you'll, you'll be able to find me if you ever send, you can send me a message, email me or uh, private message me. Um, this is kind of a sample on my page. I'll show you before and after we added a whole kitchen here, but I'm here to help you. I can, I love helping other people get into the business too. So if you're just getting into real estate, looking to flip, love to have that conversation with you and we can walk you through the process. Um, thank you so much for actually spending this evening with me to go over the flipping process. And I appreciate you all being here on the call today. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, April. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Julian.